things like high-rate algal pond systems come in. They use fast-growing algae to actively take up the nutrients from the effluent. Turning waste into biomass. Precisely. And they do it quickly. We're talking nearly complete removal of ammonium, nitrate, phosphate, often within just 24 hours. And that algal biomass itself has value for biofuels, feed supplements, you name it. A whole new era of communication in the global aquaculture industry is coming. Now you have the brightest minds in aquaculture right in your pocket. And what's best, you can listen to all of them while driving to a farm, traveling, or running errands. It's never been this good, and it's never been this simple. Welcome to the Aquaculture Podcast Show, the first AI-based podcast in aquaculture, where you'll find cutting-edge insights in everything that's working in aquaculture, nutrition, health, and production. Welcome back. Today, we're diving deep into a really critical aspect of modern shrimp farming. It's a huge industry, a big piece of that $150 billion global fish trade. Absolutely. Yeah. And as farms get more intensive, handling the waste, the effluent... Well, it becomes the major technical hurdle. Exactly. So our goal today is to really unpack the engineering and biological challenges there and uh, explore some of the genuinely cutting edge solutions that are emerging. And it's important, I think, to frame this correctly. It's not just waste. It's fundamentally about metabolic inefficiency on a massive scale. Meaning the shrimp themselves? Yes. Think about the feed. It's high in protein, maybe 30, 40 percent. But the shrimp, they only incorporate about 20, maybe 25% of that protein. Wow. Okay. So only a quarter roughly is actually used by the animal. That's right. The rest, that's unused material, leftover nutrients, ready to break down in the water. So you're immediately dealing with, what, three quarters of the input decomposing? That must have a huge impact. What's the direct consequence? Nitrogen. A significant load of nitrogen, specifically in forms like ammonia. We're talking roughly 50 grams of ammonia nitrogen generated for every single kilogram of feed used. 50 grams per kilo. Okay, that sounds, well, it sounds like a lot when you consider toxicity. How sensitive are shrimp to this? Extremely sensitive. The safe levels for those toxic nitrogen forms are incredibly low. We're talking fractions of a milligram per liter, like 0 0.0125 milligrams. That's minuscule. It is. Yeah. And the lethal levels, they can be reached quite quickly in intensive systems, sometimes exceeding one and a half milligrams per liter. That disrupts gill function, oxygen hmm. transport. It's yeah. critical. Wise Genetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads, we elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence starting now. So managing that nitrogen isn't just best practice, it's essential for survival, mm. which explains the need for water exchange or discharge, right? The volumes must be enormous. They are. For intensive systems, you could be looking at releasing five to 7,000 cubic meters of effluent just to produce one ton of shrimp. That's a staggering volume, an Olympic pool's worth, more or less. What's in that water, predominantly? Well, beyond the nitrogen from waste, you also have inputs like fertilizers used in the ponds. So the effluent typically shows elevated total nitrogen, around 1.6 milligrams per liter perhaps, and total phosphorus, maybe 1.7 milligrams per liter. Key nutrients that cause problems like eutrophication downstream. Exactly. Plus you've got other complexities hiding in there too. Residual chemicals, maybe disinfectants or pesticides, sometimes heavy metals. It's a complex mix. And this complex mix doesn't just affect the receiving waters, does it? There's evidence of impact on adjacent land, too, which is a huge factor in coastal areas. Oh, absolutely. The data is quite clear. Salinity in the soil near these ponds increases measurably, uh, something like a 0.14% increase for every meter closer you get to the pond. A measurable impact zone. I mean, how does that translate into agricultural terms, say, for rice farmers nearby? There's a direct hit on yield. Studies show that for every 10% rise in soil salinity, rice yields can drop by about 0.6%. That adds up quickly across large farming areas. So unintended consequences for neighboring sectors. And it's not just salt, is it? The soil chemistry itself changes over time. Yes, long-term irrigation or seepage from ponds alters the soil. You see increases in organic carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sometimes over 30%, the whole balance shifts. And there are even atmospheric implications. There can be, yes. When effluent interacts with certain environments like mangrove wetlands, you can get releases of potent greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide and methane. 
it just highlights that relying only on natural dilution or assimilation isn't enough. Which brings us squarely to engineered solutions. If natural systems can't keep up, we need technology. What are some of the advanced physical or chemical methods being used? Well, one interesting area is cavitation technology. It's a type of advanced oxidation process. Think of using physical forces to purify water. How does that work? It uses pressure changes to create tiny bubbles in the water. These bubbles then collapse violently, imploding. That implosion generates highly reactive hydroxyl radicals. Radicals that break down pollutants. Exactly. They oxidize organic compounds and can destroy microorganisms very effectively. We're seeing bacterial reductions over 90% within minutes. It's a powerful, chemical-free disinfection step, especially when paired with systems to remove solids first. Powerful and fast. Then there's nanotechnology, focusing on filtration at a much finer scale. Right, using materials like nanofiber membranes, they have incredibly high surface area and porosity, allowing them to filter out contaminants at the molecular level. What kind of efficiency are we talking about there? They can achieve really significant reductions, over 70% removal for things like nitrate and phosphate, while still allowing water to pass through efficiently. And what about trickier things, like heavy metals that might build up? For those, there are specialized nanomaterials, uh, nanoadsorbents. Think of them as tiny engineered traps designed to selectively capture specific metal ions. Very targeted removal. Okay, so physical and chemical methods offer powerful cleaning. But what about moving beyond just removing waste towards recycling it? Biological systems seem key here. Absolutely. That's where things like high-rate algal pond systems come in. They use fast-growing algae to actively take up the nutrients from the effluent. Turning waste into biomass. Precisely. And they do it quickly. We're talking nearly complete removal of ammonium, nitrate, phosphate, often within just 24 hours. And that algal biomass itself has value for biofuels, feed supplements, you name it. That handles the dissolved nutrients. But shrimp ponds also produce a lot of solid sludge at the bottom. That's notoriously difficult to deal with. It is. But there are innovative processes for that too, like solid state thermophilic fermentation. Sounds complex. What's the goal? It uses heat and specific microorganisms to break down that organic sludge and convert the nitrogen in it into clean ammonium gas. Ammonium gas? What do you do with that? You capture it. And then you can reuse it as a very pure, sterile nitrogen source to grow other valuable microorganisms, like specific algae strains, for example. Ah, so closing the nutrient loop directly from the sludge. That's clever. How effective is it? Very. Systems using this approach show really high pollutant removal, like over 90% for chemical oxygen demand, and nearly 70% for ammonia removal. Plus, you end up with a useful, pathogen-free biomass. It turns the disposal problem into a potential resource. Fantastic. Now let's talk about managing water quality inside the pond itself, especially for systems trying to minimize water exchange, things like bioflock and bioaugmentation. Yes, these are crucial for high-intensity, low-discharge systems. Bioflock technology uh, essentially encourages a community of microorganisms within the pond to convert waste products, uneaten feed, excreta, into protein-rich clumps or flocks. And the shrimp eat these flocks. They do. So you're recycling nutrients directly back into shrimp biomass, reducing feed costs, and cleaning the water simultaneously. It's quite elegant. And bioaugmentation helps this process along. It boosts it, yes. You actively add specific, beneficial microorganisms particularly those that excel at nitrification and denitrification, to speed up the nitrogen cycle within the pond. With the right conditions, especially the carbon to nitrogen ratio, you can achieve over 99% removal of harmful nitrogen compounds internally. Near total internal processing. So bringing all these different approaches together, physical, chemical, biological, what's the big picture message for the industry? I think the key takeaway is integration. You know, no single one of these technologies is the magic bullet. Real sustainability, real long-term profitability, it comes from combining these methods intelligently. Physical pretreatment, maybe some chemical polishing, definitely sophisticated biological recycling. Hmm. Building truly circular systems. And shifting the mindset. Absolutely. Viewing those nutrients in, in effluent, not as ways to be discarded, but as a resource to be recovered and reused, perhaps for crop irrigation, hmm. or generating that valuable algal biomass. That's not just environmental stewardship. It's becoming a real competitive advantage. It lowers costs and builds resilience. That shift from waste to resource really does change the economics. We've seen the potential, the efficiency of these integrated systems is proven. The technology is advancing rapidly. Nanoscience, smart ecological engineering, the tools are increasingly available. 
Which leaves us with a really important question for everyone involved, producers, researchers, policymakers. Given that these integrated resource recovering systems are technically feasible and highly efficient, what needs to happen next? What regulatory changes or infrastructure investments are required to make these zero discharge systems the industry standard, not just the exception? That's the crucial next step, moving from demonstration to widespread adoption. The science points the way. Definitely something critical to consider as this vital industry continues to evolve. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to follow the Aquaculture Podcast Show on your favorite platform. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook to stay updated on the latest episodes and industry insights. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.